Okay, Peter here at 2016 in a drone, and I'm here with Paul Beard from UAVionics. How are you doing, Paul? Very good. How are you doing? Wonderful. Thank you. So we were walking by your booth, and uh, what caught my eye was the ADSB, world's smallest and lightest ADSB technology. Uh, can you tell our listeners a little bit about what AD ADSB is and why this could be a revolution in a drone world or something that everybody's been waiting for? Well, I think one of the most relevant things in the drone industry right now is the public and political pressure on, um, you know, the regulators and the, you know, uh, and the manufacturers to avoid a collision with a, a full-scale airplane. I mean, it would be a pretty catastrophic event if a drone gets sucked through a 737 mm -hmm. engine. So, you know, how do you solve that problem? That is the biggest problem to solve with drones. And you know, how do you get how do you get a technology that you know would be relevant and you know and low cost and affordable in in, in that situation? And do you invent a new thing or do you leverage something that exists already? So if you kind of woke up one morning and say, well, let's use the cell phone network to solve this problem, right? It's easy, right? So a cell phone will know, you know, the GSM network will know where drones are and the, and the, uh, the ground station know where they are. But the problem is the planes don't know where they are because the planes are not equipped with GSM traffic awareness systems. Mm -hmm. And to get a new, you know, a new equipment into a, commercial aircraft is a long, long process. It can take five to seven years. Mm -hmm. So so the, the idea here is to leverage a system that exists already in full-scale aviation. Uh -huh. So that's kind of like, that's mission easy, right? You don't yeah. invent something new, you leverage something that's available already, right? Yeah. Not a problem. Okay, but so what's the catch? It's the size I can imagine because from the airplane transponders, you know, flying them, those things are big, mm -hmm. expensive. Exactly. I'll say, and uh, you know, pretty pretty difficult to kind of handle or something down and send to the put on a drone. So you were basically able to bring it down to size. Yeah, well, that, that's that's the that's the challenge. The, so that's kind of so let's call it mission hard now, right? So mission hard is how do you take an eight pound transponder uh -huh. that takes eight amps and cost eight thousand mm -hmm. dollars and make that relevant for something the size of this, right? Because yep. clearly that's going to be the only payload it's ever going to carry. Yeah. If it's eight pounds, yeah. and it's not affordable to even commercial drone operators because it's so expensive, mm -hmm. so we will call this mission hard, right? And then, and as an engineer, how do you how do you miniaturize that stuff? Since the silicon industry never invested in avionics, uh -huh. it's not like you could go to DigiKey and type in 978 megahertz receiver, and well, nothing will come up, right? Uh -huh. So there's no silicon that does that today. Mm -hmm. So it, you know, it's kind of like a a mission hard thing to kind of get it something that's small and affordable uh -huh. unless it's a stacked playing field unless you've got like a team of you know world-class engineers who have been in the previous life of the semiconductor industry uh -huh. you know you've got this unlevel un un playing field where uh -huh. you can you got a lot of friends who do silicon and and you know they owe you a few favors and yeah. hence you know we can develop a you know a transponder the size of you know a postage stamp mm -hmm. so so our, our our transponders are five grams they have no deficiencies uh, from a commercial aviation transponder uh -huh. apart from their output power. Okay. So a commercial aviation transponder has a 200 watt output power, mm -hmm. which is not necessary for the drone space because they only need to, you know, be in range for four to 40 miles or so. Mm -hmm. So 400 mile range for a drone is just not, you know, not relevant. Yeah. So, so we we took our technology we. Oh, to the FAA and said, "Look, here we've got, here we've got a fully compliant, you know, aviation grade transponder. It's five grams, but it's low power." Mm -hmm. So the the FAA they flip through their RTCA DO documents and say, "Well, wait a minute. The minimum power for a transponder is is uh, seven watts, and you're only half a watt. So, mm -hmm. sorry, you can't you can't oh, wow. play." So how did you get around that? So now this is now this is Mission Impossible now, right? Oh. So now you. Now you're trying to take, you know, a, a, you know, the, the regulatory, the size of, you know, the, the FAA, and yeah. try and change their mind. And say, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know it's written down as seven watts, but you didn't really mean that, right? Because it's just drones, right? So, so you know, we, we'll we'll do this. We'll get the job done with lower power. But all you need to do is just change this document. Yeah. There's no way. So Mission Impossible <laughs> is is this. This is a. A compliant TSO C154C, which is a 
uh, our, you know, 3,000 page RC, RTCA document compliant transceiver wow. that we've been given permission on manned and unmanned uh, platforms to, you know, have it, you know, have as a, a drone transceiver. So. So you can actually use this transceiver in an airplane as a, instead of the full-size transponder, and it's completely legal as far as the FAA is concerned. As long as it's not a certified aircraft. So as long as it's not, okay. you know, a, as long as it's a light sport or experimental. Experimental. Light sport, yep. Because it does not have a TSO, uh -huh. but it meets the requirements of the TSO. So that is amazing. How much does it weigh? That is 20 grams. 20 so, grams. 20 grams. Yeah. So anything as small as Matrice 100 or an, 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 as small as Phantom can really carry this and, yeah. and make the drone visible to the air traffic around. And w why wouldn't you want that? I mean, it, you know, oh. now you've got this, you can know where you are relative to commercial aviation. Uh -huh. Air traffic know where you are, you know, if you, yeah. you know, if you breach some airspace or something like that. And, and it's a, a nice safety barrier that keeps commercial aviation and drones, you know, aware of each other Safe. and able to avoid each other. Yes, exactly. That is amazing. Is this available on the market now? Yes, absolutely. I mean, most of the, uh, the UTM um, for, uh, um, participants at NASA use it, mm -hmm. um, as well as a few other big companies that um, are announcing things soon with it. So yeah, it's it's uh, doing doing really well. That's fantastic. What about pricing on these things? Th th these are. These are in the one thousand dollar range, but mm -hmm. um, the the small stuff is in the one hundred dollar range. Mm -hmm. So the the other the other issue that the the that the regulators had is okay. So you get six hundred thousand drones equipped with ADSB. What mm -hmm. does it do to the spectral capacity of the of the NAS? Right. Yeah. So all these things are transmitting all the time. All these dots are appearing on ATC screens. Yeah. You know, it's a, it's they're worried about that. So yeah. we came up with a new innovation called ABAS, and this was this particular system here. Mm -hmm. And that's an airspace breach alert system. So mm -hmm. normally the system doesn't transmit at all. It's if you if the drone's flying below 400 feet, mm -hmm. it's not in airspace, it's not near a hovering helicopter or anything like that. It doesn't transmit at all. Oh. So, but as soon as the, you know, as soon as something happens or something goes wrong, mm -hmm. where it flies too high or too close to a crop duster or a, mm -hmm. or a, or, or a helicopter or an emergency situation, because it can decode TFRs, you know, without an internet connection, for example, mm -hmm. then then it starts transmitting. So mm -hmm. that mitigates the spectral capacity concerns of the oh. of the regulators because if the drone's not, you know, you know, flying normally, it, it doesn't transmit at all. It doesn't pollute the airspace or anything. Yeah. Only when there's a problem, you'll hear it. So that's a much more affordable way of going, and that's something we're very passionate about doing. It's already legal in Canada and, and the UK. So, wow, that is pretty amazing. I mean, I, I just, I can imagine where this becomes a part of a standard, you know, yep. part of a drone, any drone on the market within the next few years. I mean, I, I don't see why not. Right. I mean, there's no, there's, there's no reason why it wouldn't be. I mean, it's, um, you know, it sends the right message as well. If you're a drone manufacturer, if you want to be responsible and you're grown up in the room, mm -hmm. you know, you want to be able to, you know, keep away from manned aviation. I mean, it's. Yeah. It's something that um, you know it costs very little, and it mm. you know it has a huge benefit. Totally, and I, I think this this would be a, one of the conditions to get a waiver to fly in class Bravo, correct? Um, I, I, there's a part 107 waivers right now that we're that we're kind of intensely looking at whether ADSB capability would be a you know a mitigating factor there for a waiver, and, mm. and we're cautiously optimistic that that might be part of it, and, and it should be too, I think. Oh, wonderful! Well, hopefully that happens. Where can people find more information about it or purchase the equipment? We, we uh, have a website, uavionics.com, uavionix.com. Excellent, wonderful. So you are also an inventor of something that kind of revolutionized the RC industry. That was like a foray into the drones, yeah. which is the, the 2.4 spread spectrum, correct? Yeah, and it's a similar path too, you know. Um, so I, I mean, I was, I'm an avid RC modeler and on 72 megahertz, and we used to have these long antennas and, and frequency pins and that kind of thing. And um, I actually got banned from my local flying field when I first came out with the, the 2.4 technology because it was very different. I didn't need a pin because I invented this medium access system, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't need a long antenna, it was only this <laughs> long. So they were like, what are you doing here? And I'm like, well, and it was the same, you know, my FAA then was the AMA, right? Mm -hmm. And so I fought the same battle as I'm doing with the FAA today that I did with the AMA. Yeah. And you know, it's a big institution that doesn't like change. You know, mm -hmm. they they want to take send their kids to college, right? They're happy, right? You know, they don't want to take risks. Yeah. 
and it was it's the same parallel path I'm going through now as I did then. But but Spectrum, of course, is is a is an you know, and an, an, I'm very proud of that. It was a very disruptive technology that that had a very big benefit for a lot of people, and um, and, and I hope the same is true for this. So. Absolutely. I think a lot of benefit would be the understatement. I mean, every everybody's using it now. I mean, yeah. that's that was a quite a game changer. It's kind of it's it's funny to hear that you were chased out of the field with that. No, yeah, yeah. It's, same with the the AMA. It was a very long path to you know to get them to adopt it broadly. But but you know, it's everybody's used it today. You know, so awesome, wonderful, Paul. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure meeting such a legend to the, to the RC and drone industry. Uh,